Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Syracuse University graduate Dave Pash. Pash is one of the most respected play-by-play announcers in the business. I talked with Dave about becoming the voice of the Orange at the age of 26, his move to the Arizona Cardinals and ESPN, and of course, we talked about his famous on-air partner, the legendary and wacky Bill Walton. When I started the podcast, this is a guy who I had on my initial list of must-haves. Um, he, As far as I know, unless it was in one of those media basketball games that the students have, uh, I don't know if he's ever dribbled a basketball in the Dome. Maybe he has. Uh, but, oh my God, um, to have former voice of the Orange, Syracuse grad, Dave Pash on. Uh, Dave, this is a pleasure and a treat. Thanks for coming on. Uh, it, anything for you, Mike. I mean, you, you've been somebody that uh, I've known since I was a student. So it's always great to be able to come on with you and talk Syracuse basketball and some other things. And yes, I have dribbled a basketball in the dome. Uh, I, I used to do it. First of all, I would do it. Yes. As a student for the, uh, the media cup, but also when I was the, uh, the announcer, when Bayheim was still in the locker room, you know, he wouldn't come out right away and the players are shooting around. I go out there and shoot sometimes. And as soon as I saw him coming, I'd look at Troy Weaver or hop and he'd be like, okay, he's coming. You, you gotta leave. So, uh, <laughs> so I'd always do that before Jim came out and I got busted. Um, did he ever see you? Did you, did you ever get, uh, you know, I think he did. I don't think he cared. I mean, it was just, you know, warming up and stuff. I was just shooting. I don't, I don't think he really cared. Uh, he, he's pretty, he's pretty easy going about that. Obviously once practice starts, you know, it's everybody be quiet and, you know, go to your seat. But, uh, you know, when you're just kind of waiting around for practice to start and there's just, you know, a handful of guys out there. And actually when I was a student too, you know, Hop is a couple of years older than me. When I was a student, um, I think I challenged him to one-on-one and he absolutely crushed me. But that was like cool though to play against Mike Hopkins and, you know, in the dome. Oh, wow. Now, how did AER, WAER do against the Daily Orange during your days there in the Media Cup? What kind of a player was Dave Pash? I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> we were not very good. I know that. Um, I, I don't think we had any ringers. Like I was okay. I played for a couple of years in high school. So like I was all right. And there were probably several guys that were like me. They were, they were just all right. I feel like the DO though was worse. Like I felt like they had, like nobody ever played basketball. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't even think of anybody. Cause like, no the standouts. Names. Yeah, there was no one. There was no one. <laughs> you know, you graduated from SU in 94. And five years later, you come back to take over the play-by-play duties of basketball. I mean, you were so young. I mean, what was that like for you at that age, just five years after graduating, to come back and, and become the, the voice of the Orange? You're bringing back some great memories, Mike. I, I think about that. I was uh, in Chicago doing sports radio. It was actually, well, my first year there was the last dance. It was the last year of the Jordan era. So I got to kind of cover that for, at the time, WMAQ radio and doing a four-hour talk show. I mean, that's all we ever talked about was the future of the Bulls. So that was neat. I enjoyed that. And I was doing work for the Blackhawks, but mostly pre and post game hosting. I wasn't really doing play by play. So I was now five years removed from college or four years, whatever it was. And I was starting to get a little concerned, like, okay, what I really want to do, I'm not doing. Uh, Are there opportunities out there? I have a good job. I don't want to just leave Chicago for nothing, but what else is available? And then, you know, the Syracuse job came open and obviously that I, I, I wanted it. I would have been absolutely heartbroken if I didn't get it um, and ended up getting the job. And the neatest thing about it was, I think the school wisely was a little concerned about, you know, Doug Logan had been in the market for two decades and was very popular. And now we're bringing in some 26 year old kid uh, let's help them out. Let's bring back some famous alumni broadcasters and have them do a game with Dave. So my first year, you know, 99 football season, 99, 2000 basketball as the play-by-play announcer for Syracuse, I got to do games with Marv 
and Dick Stockton and Tariko and Ian and Sean and uh, Hank Greenwald and Andy Musser. I was supposed to do a game with Marty Glickman. That's the year that Marty got sick and eventually passed away. But oh, man. Was, for me, I mean, just first of all, I'm getting a, a dream job. Because even going back to growing up in Wisconsin, I was a Syracuse basketball fan because they were on TV all the time in the late 80s. And so I, I wanted to go to Syracuse because of the basketball team, because I was a Sherman Douglas nut. And uh, so it was so cool to get that job and then also to be able to work with those guys and do games with them. So, um, I, you know, it was three years that I was there before I came to Arizona, but it was it was a great three years. Now, I'm sorry. It sounds like it would be in retrospect. Wow. That was really cool to do games with Marv Albert and and, and guys but I'm so I don't think that would have helped me if I was in your shoes do a go I would have been more nervous with Marv by my side I'm like no just let me go <laughs> it, it was I uh, look I won't lie I was nervous uh, you know Mike Tirico uh, and Sean McDonough and Ian Eagle I would say those three guys really became advocates for me uh -huh. uh, I think Mike and Sean were both on the committee as they were trying to find the next announcer for Syracuse and you know, I knew Mike a little bit, you know, Mike is probably five years older than me, six years older than me. Sean is about 10 years older than me. So, you know, I, I was still, you know, not in their age group, but I knew them a little bit because they still were very involved with a WAR, you know, and they still are. I mean, those two guys probably do more for broadcasting and broadcasters at Syracuse than anybody, you know, and then Ian as well, uh, he was doing, uh, the Nets at that time. And I think he might've just started at CBS. Uh, so, you know, these guys were so helpful to me. They made me feel comfortable. And so I wasn't as intimidated with those guys, but uh, I thought like, I thought it'd be really intimidated with Dick Stockton, but he couldn't have been nicer. Like he was so friendly. Uh, Marv was nice, but Marv, um, you know, he, I, this is somebody that I grew up absolutely idolizing him and Costas. And, you know, I got to know Bob, we didn't do a game together because I think of Bob's commitments, but you know, he was great. Uh, Marv was probably the one I was intimidated by the most, just because, you know, you're talking about again, uh, from my childhood, you know, the voice of the NBA on NBC, you think of the Jordan championships and, and him calling those games. Um, and obviously people in New York knew him as, you know, the voice of New York sports, not growing up in New York, you know, I knew him as a national guy. And then when I got to Syracuse, I learned about all this stuff, but he was the one that no question, Mike, I was the most intimidated by just because of who he is. Now you said something before that kind of intrigued me. You said you grew up in Wisconsin, a Syracuse basketball, you know, basketball fan. A lot of the kids that come to Syracuse and go to Newhouse school. Now they come here because they want to be the next Mike Tirico, Sean McDonough, you know, Marv Albert, Dave Pash. They're, they're coming here because of you guys. You didn't come to Syracuse because of, I mean, those, the, the yeah. announcer history, or was it really just because of Sherman Douglas? <laughs> no, no. So I'll let, yes. Good question. Let me clarify that. So yes. So I knew, you know, that I, in high school, that I was not good enough to continue to play basketball beyond high school. I played golf in high school and I could have played, you know, at a very small college level, but I, I wanted to stay in sports and I wanted to get into broadcasting. Uh, and all of a sudden, as I'm, you know, watching all these Syracuse games, you know, Dick Vitale was doing all the games and Syracuse was always highly ranked and fun to watch. They were kind of like the Showtime Lakers of college. So I was always watching them in the alley-oops and Dickie V starts talking about all, all these guys that went to Syracuse. And so I started learning, Oh, Bob Costas went there. Marv Albert went there, these national guys, you know, at that point, you know, Mike Tirico was probably just out of college. So, you know, he wasn't a big name yet, but Sean, I think was at CBS already. Um, so, you know, doing world series. Uh, so, you know, Dick mentioned Sean, Dick Stockton, there were other names he threw out there. So it, it started with me being interested in Syracuse because of how good they were in basketball, but then starting to hear about the broadcasting, I was like, I got to go there. That's, that's the place. And I remember going there for a visit and being in an auditorium and someone asking, uh, you know, raise your hand if you want to call Syracuse basketball and literally the entire auditorium raised their hand. I'm like, uh, first of all, I don't even know if I'm going to get in here. And second of all, if I do, boy, I, I don't know that I'm going to 
you know, I don't know that it's going to work out. There's just too many people that want to do this. You know, and I didn't get into the to Newhouse. I, I got in, I was in the VPA school. I didn't have the grades to get into Newhouse. Uh, and not because I couldn't have, I just didn't try very hard uh, in, in school, either in high school or at Syracuse for that matter. I think I can say this now, now that we're 30 years removed, I can say I didn't pay attention. Um, but I think it helped me, Mike, because when I got there, I knew that I had to be better than everybody else because they were in Newhouse and I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I knew about the history of WAR. You walk in and you see a picture at the time of Greg Papa. Uh, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and it said the next Marv Albert. And you, I, I wanted to be that or and everybody, I think, did. They wanted to be the guy who was called the next Marv. So I was driven to, to, to succeed because of WAR and because Newhouse kind of was like a rival because all these people were in it and I wasn't. And then when, you know, when I got back to Syracuse as their announcer, they let me teach a class there, an announcer class. So that was kind of fun uh, to actually be a part of the Newhouse family at that stage. Wow. Um, so what do you remember out of those, what was it, three seasons you were the voice of the Orange? Yep. Three years. Um, it was, uh, 99, 2000 and 2001 for football. Um, one of my memories is the relationship that I developed with Paul Pasqualoni, uh, wow. because, you know, when I was a student, coach P was always coming off as so intimidating. Um, and you know, you just weren't, you, you, you weren't sure, you know, how he would respond to questions or you just saw the way he coached and man, I love the guy, um, you know, working closely with him and doing coaches shows with him, great personality, uh, obviously did a tremendous job there. And I've seen him a lot in the NFL over the years, just from different gigs. And I always talk to him and he's great. So that's, that's one of the things I, I remember was how accepting he was of me as a young guy in that job. He was just cool. Like, I didn't know how he would accept me, but he couldn't have been better. Um, and I think Coach Beheim as well. I think he probably took a little bit of time to warm up to me. And I, I, I understand it. Again, here's this kid. You know, you're a Hall of Famer. Uh, you're coming in to call games. You know, you, you better prove yourself. Um, and I think, you know, I think my relationship with Jim probably was better uh, after I left. Um, only because, you know, again, I just think Jim probably for me was somebody just took a little, and maybe he's like this in general, it's just harder to get to know Jim. Um, and, you know, I think I was viewed probably as just another person in the media to him at first. And over time, I think developed that relationship. I mean, at the time, I mean, I, he's been great to me, you know, he was very good to me there. He's been great, you know, since when I've had Syracuse games over the years, you know, he's been outstanding. Um, you know, the other things that I remember, uh, you know, uh, Quentin Harris is now out here with the, the, the Cardinals. He's been here. He came here as an undraft. So he got here in 02 as an undrafted player. Um, I got here in 02 as their announcer. So it's kind of neat. Uh, and I called his games at Syracuse. I remember, I think it was against Buffalo, a 90 yard fumble recovery for a touchdown. For some reason, that game stands out and, you know, Quentin Harris and I, you know, kind of coming in together at the same time, uh, became friends. And he's now very high up in the personnel department. I think he's got a chance to be a, a GM in the NFL at some point. Um, you know, Jason Hart was on one of those teams. And, you know, I've gotten to know Jason a little bit more now that he's an assistant at USC and obviously doing all the Pac-12 games. So, look, we, we could be here all day talking about, you know, the <laughs> memories of, of, of the days back calling the games. But I was very appreciative of Coach P and Coach Beheim for – uh, just being respectful and allowing me to kind of prove myself. Because if it were me, look, if it were me, especially if I'm Jim Beheim, right, and I've, I've won a championship um, and I've been to all these Final Fours and I'm a first ballot Hall of Famer, you know, and now here comes some 26-year-old kid who's going to call my games, you know, I, I'd be a little skeptical if the roles were reversed. You know, I got to ask you, after you leave Syracuse, and you took the job, I think, with the – first it was with ESPN and then the Arizona Cardinals? It was the Cardinals first, so 2002, and then started doing some stuff for ESPN, 03. So one year after you leave, what are you thinking as you're watching the 2003 NCAA championship <laughs> game? 
<laughs> That's right. So I should say he had not, Jim had not won a championship. He had been to multiple final fours. Like oh, I right, right. Yeah. You know, 87, you know, it's funny because I got to know Steve Alford when he was here at UCLA and, you know, Keith <laughs> Smart was coaching in the NBA when, when I was doing NBA games. And, and it was like, I, I still was mad at those guys. <laughs> like I was, you know, 15 years old watching Syracuse lose a last second shot and almost in tears, you know, because of those guys against Indiana. But, um, and then obviously the great run with John Wallace, but yeah, I, I left, I think my last year, they went to the NIT. My first year, 2000, I think it was Sweet 16, they lost to Mateen Cleaves in Detroit at the Palace. Yep. And then my third year was a, was a bad year. They went to the NIT. And then the next year, they win the title. They get mellow, and they win the championship. Uh, look, I first of all, I was very jealous of Mark Johnson getting to call it. <laughs> Mark was in between uh, Matt Park and I uh, in that job. So I was very jealous of Mark, but I was, man, I, I was so happy. It was really, it was so great because you felt like, you know, you were somehow a part of it because you got to know a lot of the guys. Uh, that were a part of it. So that was uh, of my sports memories. That is in the top three or four without question. There, there wasn't a moment at all where you're like, man, uh, you know, that could have, what would my call, what would Dave <laughs> Cash's call have been? Yeah. I mean, I did, like I said, I was a little jealous of Mark. So I, yeah, I thought about like, oh man, to, to call the Hakeem Wark block. Right. Uh, the, the moment, like I, I just, I remember when coach Bayheim uh, his like moment of excitement and oh my goodness, it, it got, got the championship now, right? I got it because look, this guy was a legend already. And it just, I never being around him and watching how smart coach Beheim is as a coach and also how his, uh, how he understands personnel and like selecting personnel. Like, I mean, you knew this guy was a, an unbelievable coach it just, there were people that said, oh, he still hasn't won the championship, still hasn't won the big one. So, yeah, seeing that moment of him, the exhilaration of winning it, but also the relief, um, I, I kind of thought about, like, how would I have handled that? How would I have uh, dictated that uh, to, to the audience to try to capture the moment? All right. Now we're coming to the portion of the podcast that we've all been waiting for, where we get to talk to Dave about his most famous analyst partner, and that's Bill Walton. I mean, obviously, he's caused you to lose all your hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like calling a game with Bill Walton? Well, I'll, I'll take you back to 2006. It was my first year on the NBA. And as I mentioned to you, you know, three guys that I really, um, you know, going back to even as a student in the business that I really looked up to that I would reach out to a lot for counsel, Mike Tirico, Sean McDonough, and Ian Eagle. And Sean had worked with Bill, you know, Ian had worked with Raft all those years. So, you know, I sought their counsel. But the big one was Mike, because Tirico actually was Bill's partner on the NBA uh, that year. And Mike would have, I think it was Mike's first year doing Monday night. So he would have some conflicts. So early in the season, like I was filling in doing NBA. It was my first time doing NBA. And my first experience with Bill was a game with Bill and John Barry. That was the booth. It was Mike Tirico, Bill Walton, and John Barry. And John, who I had not met yet, um, pulls me aside the first time I meet these guys. And he says, hey, you're going to have to ask me questions tonight. Because if you don't, I'll never get in. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, this will be interesting. <laughs> and then there was a game where it was just Bill and I, and it was the, it was the day in between the final four and the championship ESPN used to have an NBA game that day. And Bill was going back and forth from the final four. And I do the game with him in Chicago. It's a Cleveland game. And LeBron takes off his headband. It was back when LeBron was young and still had the headband in Cleveland. He took it off and he threw it. I think he threw it towards the scorer's table and Bill started shouting, it's a technical foul. It's a technical foul. And I just kind of let him go just kind of let him go for 15, 30 seconds. And I get a call from Tariko, uh, it's either the next day or that week. And he says, you have to stop him. That's your job. You're yeah. there. And I'm just thinking, I'm happy to be calling NBA games. And I don't know if this is going to last, you know, I may be one and done. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm sitting next to a hall of famer and Bill Walton. I mentioned growing up watching NBC. So I remember him and snapper and Tom Hammond. And I got to work with Tom's son, David at, at Syracuse. So I remembered yeah. Bill, being wild and crazy, 
Um, but obviously sitting next to him was unique that first time. So Tariko said, you have to stop him. That's your job. You've got to cut him off and jump in and redirect. So I kind of filed that away. Yeah. And then when ESPN got the Pac-12 in 2012, this is year nine, believe it or not, uh, I kind of filed that away and remembered, okay, you know, Mike had good counsel there, stop him, jump in, cut him off. And for whatever reason, when we started working together, I, I my phone started blowing up. Um, people that I hadn't heard from in a while, like, this is hilarious. This is great. I'm thinking about, this is stressful. What are you talking about? Like, I, this is, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's insulting me. He's boxing me out. He's um, talking about things that have nothing to do with the game. But people thought it was entertaining, the, the back and forth. Sure, there were some that hated it and some that still do. But I, 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 I was kind of overwhelmed, like, wow, okay, people, I guess, like this. So um, it just kind of blossomed from there. It's funny, you know, Bill will say to me, he's, he's done this really since day one. Uh, you know, part of the, I think the, the, the fun of it is that, you know, we never really talk about it much because we like people to think that we hate each other, but we don't. You know, Bill will say, no matter what I say, no matter what I do, know that I love you. You know, he'll, he'll say that to me sometimes before a game. Um, so anyway, yeah, that, that, that's kind of the history of, of how it started with Bill and how it's going. What are some of the most bizarre topics that where the broadcast is gone with, with Bill Walton? Boy, uh, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of them. I mean, we, again, could be here for a long time talking about. I mean, about the Grateful Dead doesn't even begin to get bizarre, right? I mean, it, we start, but you, you start with Grateful Dead, you start with his bicycle. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, the first year, you know, he said some things during the Pac-12 tournament where I was like, is this guy trying to get fired? Like, I don't want to repeat them because like they were at the time, like, boy, if anybody else other than Bill Walton said that they're probably gone. Um, <laughs> you know, the time a couple of years ago where at the end of regulation, Bill gets up, it's an overtime game in the Pac-12 tournament, Bill gets up to go to the restroom. Uh, I remember was, that. Oregon, I can't remember who they were playing, but all the guys in Vegas in the front row, you know, all the big money guys turn around and look at me like, where's he going? What's he doing? And I'm like, I don't know. And, you know, Bill, he can't move very well. He can't run. So right. he's walking to the restroom. And, of course, you know, with our show, we're like, okay, as soon as he comes out, you know, get the camera on him. So, of course, the camera's on Bill. Like, the game's in one box, and here's a two box of Bill coming back from the restroom and he almost runs into the official. He's like on the sideline, but he's walking like close to the court. He almost runs into the official. And, and mind you, a minute or a minute and a half of action has gone by. So I'm calling overtime by myself. So that's a minute. And then I don't know if you can see this, but he makes these cards for me um, at the end of each season. Like it's part of my gift. And this was, I think this was, no, it wasn't the first one I did. This was like three or four years later, but you know, it says acknowledge your problems and find your path forward. And he puts a blonde wig on me here. And Bill and I are driving the Grateful Dead bus. And it says, you know, we do what we want. And the rest of the dead is in the bus with us. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, I get a, I get a signed album but from Mick Fleetwood. Um, I mean, there's just so much stuff, Mike, you know, of things oh that Bill, God. you know, one time he's talking about, uh, you know, feeding the post. And he's like, you've got to milk him. You've got to milk him. And Bill goes, and I, and he just like out of nowhere says, I've been milked, you know, like, but <laughs> you know, or when he's talking about when you go game in bold, he's like, here we are high in the Rockies. I love elevation. You know, the, you know, just that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there was a game the other day, uh, <laughs> the guy sets a wide screen, you know, and he describes it as the Larry Craig stance. Um, if you don't know what that is, I'm not going to say it, but just Google it. Um, it's things like that, you know, just, you don't know where he's going. He's just, he's got this list. I mean, people do think Mike, he doesn't prepare. He prepared, he over, I've never seen anybody prepare more. Like we'll have a zoom meeting with a coach. We may have had the team eight times. He'll still ask like 30 minutes worth of questions. He's taking all these notes. Now, a lot of notes are on, you know, what, uh, and we did a game in Oregon and uh, as USC, Oregon state, and he's asking Andy Enfield, you know, would you ever vacation in Oregon? You know, he starts asking all these, you know, questions of, you know, like. It's amazing you bring that up. 
I've sat in on a Bill Walton um, pregame interview with a coach where you go in and you get a little background. And um, it was in Washington, so it was Mike Hopkins. I was there to do a story on Hop. And Hop said, no, you're coming in. And so I got to go in and I sit in on this meeting with Bill Walton. And I think, I want to say the play-by-play -play guy was um, Roxy Bursty. Okay. I think Roxy asked one question. And the rest of the meeting is taken over by Bill Walton. And he didn't ask a single question that I would have asked. Correct. But he asked all the questions he wanted to and probably got all the material he wanted to have it was and it was bizarre and yet i it was it was an experience <laughs> oh yeah i mean he'll he will it, you know he does ask basketball questions or you know he'll ask about players but he does get try to get deep in with and he loves to talk to the coaches about their families and yep. you know he, he sung happy birthday to bobby hurley's daughter the other day on the air and then it you know he, he then ate two candles that were lit you know and then and then dove into the chocolate cake and he just, you know, sat there with his face into the chocolate cake and then popped his face up and he's got chocolate all over it. We did do a game at Washington. He and Hop is interesting because, you know, they would talk about rock and roll and, and all the concerts that Mike goes to. And um, before Hop did, went there, you know, Bill likes to do things with other sports. We did something with the crew team where we went out on boats and, you know, Bill had his crew outfit on and then did the game in his crew outfit and it looked like a big onesie you know because it barely fit him it's a 611 guy in a crew outfit so he sat there in the stands and at Washington you're about 15 rows up you're not courtside so he's basically surrounded by fans and here he is calling the game yeah. in his wetsuit it was it was priceless unbelievable non-Bill Walton division who's your favorite partner that, that you've worked with over the years I can't answer that. There's too many. I can't. I'd get in trouble. I've been blessed, Mike, to work with. I have a list. There was okay. a list. Van Gundy. Love Jeff. Hubie Brown. Love Hubie. Urban Meyer. Love Urban. Had a great year with Urban. We're still still friends. I'm going to get to somebody you hate. Um, Jay Billis. No, I love working with Jay. I <laughs> wish I worked more with Jay. Jay's awesome. He's, he's one of the best in our business. Dick Vitale. The first time I worked with Dick, so there's a story there, as I mentioned, growing up in Wisconsin, watching Syracuse, listening to Dick Vitale, who was ESPN at that point, right? I mean, ESPN didn't have a ton of games. The ones they had, he was doing. Uh, and in 2004, I think it was my first like full year at ESPN, um, Brad Nessler was doing the Saturday Prime games with Dick Vitale, and I wasn't doing a lot of games. And Brad got stuck in Atlanta because of a, an ice storm. And so I get a phone call the day of a Texas-Kansas game in Lawrence. The phone call is, can you get on a plane in two hours and get to Kansas? You're going to do the game with Dickie V. So you talk about being nervous. Okay. Um, he could not have been nicer and more welcoming. And I was nervous as I'll get out. And then about three years ago, four years ago, I did an NBA game with Dick and Bill. And that was, uh, that was interesting. I talk about not getting a word in. Yeah. I was going to ask you how much, a good thing you don't get paid by the word. They want, I mean, they talked for the two, the two and a half hours. They probably talked for two, two twenty eight. I'll bet overall, like when Clay Thompson had his, uh, uh that th 37 point quarter, whatever it was. And they said he took 11 dribbles, you know, and at 37 points, that was like me. I took, I, I probably said, you know, over the course of the two and a half hour broadcast, two minutes worth of content. <laughs> there you go. Show that one to your, to your class, to your students. Next time you, you have to talk to an SU class, Get, show them that game tape. Yeah. This is how probably, you do it kids. Yeah. It's probably not one that uh, I I'd recommend sending to the hall of fame. That's for sure. Um, this has been a pleasure. We could probably go on for a very long time and talk about all your other announcing partners and your experiences in the booth. But uh, we're just going to have to save some of that for another day. Uh, but I appreciate your time and, uh, and, and your stories, Dave. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too, Mike. Great seeing you. Thanks for having me on.